okay. You're good to go. Okay. I'll uh, open the meeting of the select board. Um, this is the select board meeting and public hearing for the interim zoning bylaws um, starting at 650 um, because it was publicly announced that the public hearing will start for the interim zoning at seven. Um, first item would be to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. Hearing none, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Before we go on to public, um, I'm gonna be recusing myself from the public hearing so I can speak on behalf of one of my buildings. So. Um, just note that at seven o'clock, I will be handing the meeting over to Chris, um, but I believe I can still run it until then. Um, so we're a couple minutes before public. I don't know if anyone is here from the public, but we can wait a couple minutes. Unless Steve and Harry, you have anything that's outside of the interim bylaws you wanted to discuss. Not I, Mark. Okay. Hey, Mark, I'm going to try Patty Martin. She was going to take minutes. I, I can take minutes if necessary, but uh, let me see if I can reach her. I'm just going to go on mute for a minute. Okay. Otherwise, these are going to be the longest eight minutes of your life. <laughs> Well, it's good to see that that eight minutes is uh, filled with public from the uh, comments from the public. Correct. And for those attending, you are, well, I guess it's a little different in this one. So it's open for public comment, I believe, for the first hour, and then it transitions over to the select board to decide if they want to make any changes after the public portion of the meeting. It looks like Ken's joined us. George is joining us. Philomena's coming in. Um, we're still in the public comment section of just the regular meeting. The public hearing will start at 7 p.m. But if anyone who's joined wanted to talk about anything outside of the interim zoning, um, feel free because we have until 7 o'clock. Our right, Patty's going to join us here in just a minute to take minutes. Um, so I can cover until she gets locked in here. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we can really do anything until seven. So I think we're Mark, Mark um, yep, but one of the things that we should make sure that we do, which we didn't do the last time, where we had. Um, a joint planning commission select board you want to make me think, no. <laughs> is to make sure that we convene not only that you convene the select board meeting that but that i also yeah. convene the opening That's of perfect. the planning commission meeting it's a small point but we should just make sure we do that perfect and uh when do you want to open your meeting i believe the the agenda said for seven o'clock so i guess we're we're still early and at this point we do not have a quorum, so I would say we should wait till seven o'clock. Okay. Nobody can hear me, right? I'm muted. Uh, we can oh, hear you. We can hear you, George. Oh, you can hear me. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making dinner. But... <laughs> Mark, um, Mike is coming in here, I think. There you are. Hey, Mike. So for those who joined after we opened, the select board meeting is open right now. We're, we're in the, we're, it's public comment. So if anyone wants to talk about anything outside of the interim zoning, feel free until seven o'clock and then we'll open up. Uh, 
we'll open up the public hearing for the interim zoning bylaws and also open the uh, the planning commission meeting at the same time. But this is an opportunity to speak to anything else besides the interim zoning bylaws. So Mark, Bill's going to join us here in a couple minutes too. He just went into his office. Ken, do you leave your meeting open just for the seven to eight o'clock hour or do you stay open until the end? Um, well, we'll, we'll stay open as long as we have reason to be here, but otherwise we're not going to be conducting any other business. And at this point, um, I don't know if Steve has been appointed yet to the, you have been appointed. Okay. So at this point it's myself and Steve and, um, there's no, so we don't have a quorum, so we can't. We can't really make any decisions on what we do. We now have a quorum. Eric is here. So, but well, when we're done with with the business that coincides with your meeting, we would adjourn our meeting at that point. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and open yours, I think, since we have we're sitting here until seven. Okay, I'm gonna uh, convene this meeting of the Waterbury Planning Commission at uh, six fifty-seven. Uh, I would note that we have myself, uh, Ken Bellow, the chair, and Steve Karcher and Eric Gross from the Planning Commission are here in attendance. Hello. Hey, Bill. <clears throat> hey, Bill. Mark, you may want to mention the public comment again. We've had a, a couple additional people join us. Okay. Um, so we have opened the select board meeting. Planning Commission's also opened up their meeting. Um, it is currently open to public comment outside of anything to do with interim zoning bylaws, which will start at 7 p.m. But if anyone's joined the meeting, who wants to talk about anything else besides the bylaws, feel free at this time. Um, you can either start talking, raise your hand, mention in the chat. Um, you are also more than welcome to speak during the meeting through the public hearing that'll start at seven um, and then later at 8.30 for any other business. Um, so yep, if anyone has anything they'd like to say before we get started at seven, feel free. Mark, who are the members from your from the select board that are here? Katie, Chris, Mike, and Danny. I think we're all here. Danny's on. Okay, thank you. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to be uh, recusing myself at seven o'clock, and Chris will be taking over the meeting so I can speak to some of my buildings. Chris, the meeting is yours. Okay, Mark, thank you. Um, so I wanna just verify that it looks like there's 21 people on the screen. I don't know if there's anybody else kind of hidden. Um, but we're here to have a discussion and uh, listen to input about the uh, current draft, recent draft 
on the zoning interim bylaws for downtown district. And uh, that last draft was put out April 5th, 2021. Is that correct, Steve? That's correct. Okay. Um, I remember that last meeting, Steve, you had suggested maybe you want to just kind of give an overview of uh, what's been done and then we'll take questions and comments after that. Chris, before we start, I know there are several people on the meeting that really aren't fully identified. You know, there's a TG, there's a Philomena. Um, I could scroll down and see if there are others, but if they could uh, recognize themselves. And we've got Mike's iPhone and- uh, Mike Merchant. That. Say that again. Mike Merchant. Philomena, what's your last name, please? She's still showing us connecting on yeah, my screen. I, I think that's I, Philomena Signer. I, that's what I was thinking, but uh, yeah, you're right. I see that she's still trying to connect there. TG, could you identify yourself, please? In the text, Tom Glor. Tom, what now? Glor. G L O O R. Glor. Glor. G L O O R. I, I just got to text. Okay. okay. And then for the time being, that seems to be everybody. So, Eve's the floor yes. is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Um, so, um, I'm also hosting, so if I seem a little distracted, it's because I'm trying to make sure everybody gets admitted. But what I'd like to do is share my screen with the proposed interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district. And um, I'm not going to go through every section of the bylaws, but I would like to hit some highlights. I know we've had some comments. We had some comments from uh, the Waterbury area development committee and um so i just like to go through some of those uh aspects and um <clears throat> we do have three members of the planning commission with us as well so um they work with me very closely in developing this and uh, this draft came with a recommendation from the planning commission so i just wanted to mention that hey steve so i'm gonna Share my yes. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just just before you share your screen, um, I was looking at the interim bylaw on the website, and on page seventeen, the last section sixteen ten talks about the zoning map for the district. Right. But I don't see the zoning map anywhere on these seventeen pages. Am I missing something? Um, so there are two different documents. The way it was set up on the um, website is there's the latest news piece on the home page, and there are two different links. Um, if any, if anybody wants to go that, pull it, go there and pull it up on your own screen. And the, um, there's a link to the text, and then there's a separate link to the map. So okay. we didn't try to make it um, the same document. And I can share uh, the map as well. If um, that's fine. Okay, so anything else before I share my screen that anybody wanted to say? All right, let me go ahead and um, pull that up. Uh, just bear with me for a minute. Okay, can I uh, just uh, expand this a bit? Uh, can everybody see this on your own screen? Uh, I'll get a, a nod or two, Chris, you're nodding. So looks yep. like we're, we're all set. So um, these interim bylaws, uh, as I mentioned, were developed from um, the uh, draft unified development bylaw that the Planning Commission has been working on for um, over three years. And uh, it deals just with one proposed zoning district, the downtown zoning district. And um, I'll, I'll go to the map here in a little while. Um, it's a uh, expanded a bit from our current downtown uh, downtown commercial district, and um, it does take in the um, most of the designated downtown as well. 
So the purpose of these bylaws, uh, interim bylaws are uh, fall under state statute. They um, have, once they're adopted uh, by the legislative body, in our case, the select board, they have a life of two years and then they can be extended for a year. So um, these are in response to our situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. And they're really intended to help facilitate economic development and uh, housing density in the downtown. So those are the two primary goals. Um, and they uh, define various industrial and commercial uses. Um, and uh, some of those uses are, are limited in scale to uh, be appropriate to our downtown area. Uh, much of the downtown is uh, made up of historic buildings, so that's a factor as well. In the applicability, uh, this is uh, basically a section which um, outlines uh, what these bylaws are, are applicable to, and um, they're applicable to the current uh, downtown commercial zoning district that um, has been um, expanded to, into what we're now calling the downtown zoning district. Uh, I'll go over the zoning map um, once I get through the, uh, the draft here. So um, uh, this encompasses a portion of the downtown design review overlay uh, that I mentioned, and that's uh, coincidental, coincidental with our designated downtown. So uh, there are bylaws which will still apply in this downtown zoning district that are part of this uh, so-called uh, downtown design review overlay district. And um, so um, this also says that um, uses that are, uh, are not allowed in this district are, um, are specifically prohibited. And uh, it also says that uh, no select board review is available for such prohibited uses under the standards of 24 VSA section 4415E. So uh, this is the state enabling statute for interim bylaws, and um, we can have some more discussion if we need to. Um, under normal bylaws, the, the legislative body or the select board in our case does not have authority to do any review of development uh, or allow uses which aren't specifically prohibited by the bylaws. However, under the interim bylaw, under the enabling statute, uh, the, um, the select board is given authority uh, if they so choose, it's a may. So they may um, allow uses that are, are prohibited under the interim bylaw and they may review those projects if proposed under a set of limited criteria that are spelled out in uh, this uh, section of 24 VSA section 4415E. So um, we, we reviewed this applicability with our um, municipal attorney that advises us on, on planning law. And um, this is um, Dave Rue with our that would affirm Stitzel Page and Fletcher. And Dave recommended that we limit the select board review. And what this does is it places all review within the purview of the development review board if it's if it's not specifically allowed for approval by uh, review and approval by the zoning administrator. So this does not um, uh, limit any development under these interim bylaws um, that's allowed. Uh, specifically allowed under under the review. So um, I just wanted to outline that this comment has come up a couple times, and we can have some more discussion under the comment period if that would be helpful. But I wanted to outline that. Uh, I mentioned that uh, these bylaws are effective for a period of two years, and then they can be extended for one year, and then their uh, life, if you will, is is over. Um, they in the in that time frame. They can be incorporated into permanent bylaws and be adopted as so-called permanent bylaws. So that's, um, I think, the intention of the Planning Commission is to move on 
and uh, work these into uh, an early phase of implementing the Unified Development Bylaw as, as permanent bylaws. So the district purpose um, is to allow uh, concentrated retail service, office housing, other compatible uses, um, limited um, industrial uses, light industrial uses. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there are permitted uses and conditional uses. Permitted uses uh, that are other than one and two family dwellings are reviewed uh, under uh, site plan review. And um, you can see that there are some limits or thresholds on some of these uses. Uh, the Planning Commission is recommending a threshold of 4,000 square feet. And um, the way that works is um, if it's more than that um, amount, then you have to look and see if it's listed as a conditional use. So um, any many uses, um, not all, but some of these uses are um, allowed as permitted uses, regardless of the size, they only require site plan review, but some of the uses that can have a, a more serious, if you will, or a broader impact are also reviewed under uh, conditional use. And that list um, is, uh, in, is the next section. So this outlines uh, all those uses that um, require conditional use. And some of them are any size of that use is conditional, like a hotel or motel, and uh, an event facility or a nightclub, uh, catering, kitchens. Uh, so some of these uses are exclusively um, conditional use. The ones that were listed as up to um, <clears throat> 4,000 square feet, like retail, personal services, um, that I think it's like a bank, um, office professional, uh, and a restaurant. If it's more than 4,000 square feet, then um, it would be a uh, conditional use. So it's a, I call it a threshold at 4,000 square feet. Um, there are three of these uses that um, are limited to have an upper limit in the size. Uh, they're food or beverage manufacturing and closed up to 4,000. So an example of this would be a food production. Ben and Jerry's is a good example of a food manufacturing business. Beverage manufacturing uh, would be a brewery, um, a, a facility that produces uh, hard cider, that type of thing. Um, light industry and closed. This would be the silk screen business on uh, Foundry Street. Foundry Street is a good example of a light industry that was approved in this district and that use is I think around 3,000 square feet. Um, so the um, let's see some Steve, of the real quick. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, under number 10 and say number 11 and 12 is there a, is there a phone siding list of businesses that fall under those categories well there's a definite how do you determine yeah. how do you determine who considers what light industry is right so so there's a definition for all of these uses and um, i'll i'll go to that next so um, um so the, let me just cover the dimensional standards first and i'll try not to move my screen too fast because i know that it really makes my head spin. I'll try not to uh, subject any of you to that. So dimensional standards are just that, minimum lot sizes, um, height limits, setbacks, and um, so on, the minimum build tree line coverage, that's the amount of the, the, the front of the building, uh, has to fill at least that amount of the lot. Steve, hang on, hang on, Steve, we're getting a lot of background noise here. I don't know where it's coming from. It's coming from Lori. Okay. Right. And make sure you're muted unless you're talking. It would be helpful. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay, good. So uh, build two line, um, build two line coverage is 
<clears throat> some of um, an aspect of uh, what's commonly referred to as form based code. It's uh, trying to create a certain uh, design in a in a downtown kind of area, and that is the minimum amount of the uh, front of a of a building um, that um, is. So if a lot is 100 feet wide, the building would have to cover at least 60 feet. So it 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 creates a streetscape where you don't have uh, buildings with parking lots in front of them or large amounts of open area, the buildings that come up uh, closer to the sidewalk. And there's also a maximum front setback. There are no minimum setbacks for any sides of a lot in the downtown because many buildings fill um, most, if not all their lot. Some of them are right up to the uh, right of way line. Bill, so, I mean, uh, Steve, uh, sure. Bill had a, a comment there. I just see it come up on the chat. Um, Bill, if you want to chime in and and state your point. Your yeah, point. sorry, my typing was pathetic. It, it, this is a very technical point. The the permitted uh, use is up to 4,000 square feet, and then the conditional is greater than 4,000 square feet. It should be up to and including 4,000 square feet so that we have something at 4,000 feet covered. It's a very technical drafting point. Okay, all right. Well, sorry we about my that. typo. Okay. Um, I think the intent to up to 4,000 would include 4,000, but we can we can clarify that with a less than or equal to. Um, thanks, Bill. Sorry about so, that, Steve. Um, maximum front is um, so a building has to be within 10 feet of the right of way line. Typically, in the downtown, it's the back of the sidewalk, but uh, that would be the edge of the street right of way. And what this does is it uh, again brings buildings up to the front of the lot and then parking would typically be to the side or the rear so that's the purpose of this maximum front setback um, <clears throat> there's a minimum principal building height of 24 feet so that creates again a streetscape with uh, taller buildings that are at least 24 feet tall this would be for new buildings it wouldn't apply to an existing building uh, it's typically a two-story building. It wouldn't have to be. It could be a tall one-story building, but uh, this is a minimum uh, building height. Then there's a maximum structure height of 60 feet. So that's just what it um, says. And then there's a maximum principal building footprint. Uh, the Planning Commission is recommending 5,000 square feet. I know there's been some comments about that, so we can have some further discussion about that and what um, the range of building sizes in this district for uh, especially uh, non residential or commercial buildings. So we can come back to any of this there's uh, maximum residential density, this is important for housing projects, there's no minimum or maximum residential density so density would be controlled by um, lot size by having adequate parking and uh, things of that nature size of the building that's allowed. So that's important to note right now we, we do have a, a maximum density in this district, but um, there, there is none proposed. So uh, definitions, uh, if they're not defined here in these interim bylaws, then the definitions under our current zoning regulations would apply. Um, however, the, the uses are all defined under uh, in the use and dimensional table. So I'm gonna expand this a bit. If anybody has trouble seeing it, let, let me know. Um, and uh, you can also go to the front homepage of the website and pull this up if, that, if that's helpful. So, and we can zero in on any of these specific definitions. But um, Chris, this goes to your question about um, the, how the uses are defined. So these are the definitions. The Planning Commission like will likely put this in a separate section when we get uh, when we develop the permanent bylaws but for right now they're presented in this table and then uh, there's a column for the downtown or dwn zoning district right here if there's a p that means that it's a permitted use uh, other than one and two family dwellings it would require site plan review if there's a c like um, assisted or supported living facility that means it's a conditional uh, or let me, uh, skilled nursing, I mean, so, sorry, skilled nursing service. 
So that's uh, a, uh, like a nursing home that provides uh, skilled nursing services under state license. That's conditional use. Hotel or motel, I mentioned that before, any size of a hotel or motel is a conditional use. And then when we get into the commercial uses, you'll see that um, there's the up to 4,000 and then a greater than 4,000. So uh, Billy, this speaks to your uh, concern. What the way this is written, if it's up to and including 4,000, um, it does include 4,000. If it's greater than, then um, it would be a conditional use. So a 4,000 square foot retail operation would be permitted. If it's over 4,000, it would be a conditional use. So I'm not going to go through all of these uses. Uh, we can come back to any of these. I would like to highlight a couple that have come up uh, for comment. Restaurant slash bar uh, has come up for comment. Um, there is a some language in here dealing with um, the portion of the floor area that um, has indoor seating. Um, this certainly doesn't mean that you can't have a restaurant with less than 40% as eat-in uh, seating. That's fine. It just uh, more has to do with how it's defined. I know this may create some confusion, and uh, we could look at clarifying that language. But it's intended that if it's serving uh, preparing and serving meals for immediate consumption um, and has uh, seating on site, then um, it, it would be defined as a restaurant. So that may need a bit of clarification. I know we've had a couple comments on that aspect from um, part of our area development um, committee, so on. I, I certainly respect that. So um, I'll talk a bit about the uh, food or beverage manufacturing and light industry. Um, the Planning Commission is recommending a limit on these two uses of 4,000 square feet only. Um, that figure could be changed. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, again, a scale issue. And um, these are, I, I gave an example of um, both of these uses before. So we can come back to this if there are questions about what might be included in that use. Uh, some uses uh, have an X. That means that it's, it's not an allowed use. It's a prohibited use. And, uh, and as we mentioned, the select board would not have the authority under this draft to allow that. So a self-storage facility like a mini storage would not be allowed. A uh, tank farm or fuel storage uh, would not be allowed. And um, and so on, freight transportation services, you couldn't have a, a freight depot, that type of thing. Um, it doesn't mean they won't be allowed in other districts, uh, they, they probably will, but in this particular district, it's not allowed composting facility, recycling services, and um, so on, sawmills. So these are all uh, heavier duty um, industrial kinds of uses. Um, arts, entertainment, and recreation are all lumped together in one category. Movie theaters are allowed at any scale, either as a permitted or conditional use. Uh, clubs, this would be like the, um, uh, the uh, VFW hall, uh, artist galleries. This would be like uh, uh, Maker Sphere would fit into this category. Uh, museums are allowed at any scale as a permitted use. Uh, indoor recreation, this would be a gym facility, a sport fitness facility, and so on. Um, they're allowed at any scale, is either permitted or conditional. And then uh, an outdoor, commercial outdoor recreation would, would not be allowed. This would be like a golf course, things of that nature. And uh, campground specialty schools, uh, this was the third one that has a limit. So this would be a private uh, educational facility. Um, so that, that has an upper limit of 4,000 square feet as recommended by the Planning Commission. And then we go into uh, civic and community uses. Um, and this would be like a, a state certified uh, educational institution, a school, and so on. Um, hospital would not be an allowed use. That's a full blown. However, a clinic is certainly allowed as a conditional use, uh, clinic or outdoor. Uh, or outpatient care services, any kind of uh, social assistance, charitable services, a church, that would be a permitted use. 
Excuse me, Steve. Yes. Uh, Whitney Aldrich just asked if there was a building in town that you could use as an example that would give her an idea of what thousands, 4,000 square foot building would look like. Is there some example that you can toss out there? Well, um, yeah, I think, um, Whitney, I think your building is about 4,000 square feet. I can look back at the, um, I don't want to take a lot of time. I have a chart here, but right. I think both of the, um, the WDEV buildings are, are in that scale on, on Stowe Street. Um, let's see if there's another good example. Um, this building is much larger than that, but um, yeah, let me, let me take a look at that. Um, the new building at 28 Stowe Street is about 2,500. Um, so the building, the 30 Foundry Street building is just under 4,000 square feet. That's where Makersphere is on the second floor. And that's a good example. Um, the, as I said, the WDEV buildings are just under 4,000 or just over. So that's a good example of buildings at that scale. Yeah, I think that's probably sufficient. Okay. Steve, thanks. Good. Good. Okay. So I'm going to uh, get, I know we want to get into public comment here. Uh, we've already gone through the dimensional table. This just provides a definition for each of those uh, dimensional uh, requirements. So that's in the bylaw. Spe uh, specific use standards. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, the Planning Commission spent a lot of time on these uh, accessory dwellings. These are accessory dwelling units. And uh, we worked with our attorney on this one. Um, this is a use by right. Home occupation, again, a use by right. Uh, home businesses, this is a new use that would allow more robust businesses with site plan review. Uh, family child care home, residential care group home, these are uses by right as a single family use. Um, the uh, sober houses fall under this right now. There's new legislation that would create a separate use there. Bed and breakfast is allowed um, in. So a bed and breakfast is a smaller facility. In would be 12 bedrooms or more. Uh, the stage, uh, Stagecoach Inn is a good example of an inn. And then uh, short-term rentals would be accessory use of, of any residential property. That's not um, really limited or prohibited at all. Motel, hotel, we've talked about um, open air markets, uh, auction houses, restaurant bars. This, uh, so these provide some additional standards for the review of these facilities, uh, mobile food services, uh, food trucks, that type of thing, uh, event facilities and nightclubs. And then there's some performance standards and these only apply to a couple um, a couple of uses. They don't apply to every use. That was one comment that came out of earlier um, and <clears throat> I can I can detail that I know um, I think home businesses require performance standards to be um, utilized and I think there was one other um, I'll, I'll have to jog my memory a bit on that one so so I think that's an important point conditional use has its own standards that are in our current bylaws but these are supplemental standards um, that would be important in something like a home business that's only going through um, site plan review. And then enforcement and, and zoning. I'm going to touch on the map very quickly and then we can come back to um, the, the standards. So I did want to show everybody the map so that um, it's clear what areas is included. So if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Uh, see if I can enlarge this. All right, I'll try to give you some context. Um, let's see, I could enlarge it a little bit more. Okay, so just to get you oriented, I'll use my uh, cursor here, Stowe Street. Uh, the district is this, um, if, uh, light purple shade, that's the proposed downtown zoning district. Uh, this is the gas station that's at the top of Bank Hill, this L shaped lot, Simpson Graves building. Uh, this deep one is um, 
Mark's building, the reservoir, I believe. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's where Mansfield Orthopedics is. I'm, my apologies. Reservoir is in here, right here. This is Mansfield uh, Orthopedics, former Waterbury um, Medical Associates, for those of you who've been around for a while. And then at the other end, uh, this is Warren Court, which is this is the horseshoe at the state complex right here. Warren Court is at the beginning of the horseshoe. And then uh, it goes to just across from the uh, horseshoe drive, the first horseshoe drive. It takes in Moody Court, the, um, Water, the Washington, uh, Washington County Mental Health Building, takes in the commercial buildings on the southwest side, the um, C.C. Warren House, where um, Darby uh, London Nordal offices, and uh, that's right in here. The um, McCain Consulting Building, the one at the corner here with the eye doctor. So this is the other end. So unless there are any uh, questions about the map, I'll I'll take my screen share off and then we can shift to comments. Does anybody have any questions about the map before I I stop? Eva. The only question I had is at one point there was a discussion about perhaps expand expanding that downtown district towards the railroad underpass there. It looked like you guys kind of decided not to go there at this point. Right. So um, this is uh, proposed to be the mixed use district. Uh, right now it's village mixed residential. It would stay that way. So it would still allow offices, uh, bakeries, that type of thing. Um, and same uh, south of this area along Main Street. So um, the concern here of extending it is it would allow some of these um, lighter industrial uses to potentially go into these mixed residential districts. So my recommendation is that we wait and let the Planning Commission uh, work on this. I'm hoping that that'll be part of the next phase of, of the Unified Development Bylaw and let them address the question of how that district is structured. But it's not really designed to be a downtown district with that intensity of use, height of buildings and so on. Understandable. Okay. All right, I'll stop my share and then, um, so Chris, if you wanna take it from here, that would be great. Sure, so I guess we can entertain some uh, comments from the public at this point, or uh, anybody that's concerned about what's been drafted so far and uh, feel free to raise your hand and come onto the screen and let us hear what you got to say. Eric. So I do wonder if water is missing an opportunity to address cannabis businesses in the downtown district. So that we might want to limit uh, retail and commercial growing in this district. I know it's a, uh, Sort of a bigger discussion, but now it seems like it'd be a good time for that. Ken, any input on that? Or? Um, well, you know, Eric has brought up cannabis a couple of times, the planning commission, but we didn't really have any sort of an in depth discussion about it. And the one thing that we did discuss is. I know Eric went to a, uh, I think an online uh, seminar training thing on it, but Steve had provided some information about the state statute. And my recollection is there's a provision in there that says that the town can potentially establish a cannabis control board. And my comment at the planning commission was that the first order of business seems to me to be that the select board should take up whether or not you want to establish a cannabis control board. Uh, and, and I know that the voters have said that that recreational cannabis sales cultivation is uh, is acceptable in Waterbury. So that that point has been handled. But it seems to me that the that that the issue about whether the select board wants to establish a board that should be taken up. And then um, how the town might handle whether it's sales or cultivation. Um, I mean, it just seems to me, this would be my own opinion, 
again, we haven't, as a commission, we didn't take this up in depth, but it seems to me it would be an appropriate item for discussion in terms of um, long-term zoning as opposed to kind of put into this interim bylaw at the last minute because it it really just came up. Right. Um, so that's 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 my take on it. But again, the, the most important part is that the planning commission did not discuss this in any sort of detail. No, you're correct. Um, I think that is the first step that uh, a commission has to be uh, put forward to uh, recognize what what the limits are that are going to be allowed and and perhaps even where um, or before the planning commission can even incorporate it into any district at all. Yeah. I think I think Eric that you're going to have to go that process before before anything can be done. Yes, I think Mike has something he wants yep, to add. Yep, I just see that. Mike? If, um, if the state legalizes uh, commercial cannabis retail distribution, how is that any different than other commercial activities? I don't, I don't see where it is. It's just another commercial. It's just, I know it's, you know, cannabis is stigmatized by by a lot of people, but it's just another product. If if someone was selling house plants and growing a few house plants, there would probably be zero uproar about it. And I just look at it, it, you know, I know people have mixed opinions about it. I have mixed opinions about it, but to me, I feel it falls under the commercial definition. My personal opinion. Well, it is a controlled substance um, that, that is does differentiate it from, you know, house plants and garden vegetables. Steve, you had something to say? Well, just briefly, um, as you probably recall, the um, the article that was approved by Australian ballot uh, stated that I believe it's October, I think the 22nd of, uh, of 2022 when um, when the law takes effect, it gives us some time. I, I agree with Ken. I think this is a great topic for the Planning Commission to talk about in their, the next phase of work on some permanent bylaws. And, and I think that's the appropriate place, along with um, the formation of the board, which is more of an administrative process that the select board will want to be talking about. But it's certainly appropriate that we address it through zoning. But I, I would agree. I think to try to limit retail or try to um adapt to these bylaws before we really have that discussion and know what direction the community wants to go i, I think it's uh, it's premature but i agree it's a priority right and uh i'm looking at the time here and time is short to address what we currently have in front of us so i think we should just concentrate on that for tonight um whether or not we can run over a little bit on our time if if uh there's more questions than we can answer in, in the half next half hour. So, uh, I'm so Ryan, you. I'm sorry, Danny. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a follow-up quick question. So that because in 2022, you know, it would be uh, feasible to have here if we have established uh, a control board. In theory, even within these interim bylaws. Um, it's, it could potentially be approved by the DRB, correct? Even if it's not specifically within the, these bylaws. Yeah, I think we need to get some advice. So, you know, retail sales is retail sales, mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, it's going to require licensing, I assume, by by this board. So there's lots of unanswered questions that we need to explore. That's my point. Thanks. So I think one of the sticking points, see until nobody else will bring it up, is uh, the square footage in the industrial aspect of these regs. Um, I know there's been some comments in the past about not being sufficient size uh, and limits businesses to scale up, uh, you know, depending on what 
certain types of businesses they are. Um, anybody have any comments on, you know, what got you to the 5,000 square foot? Um, and is there any room for movement on that from the planning commission? Uh, that's something you can help us out with, Ken or Steve. Well, let, let me just make a point. Uh, you know, this is a draft that the planning commission recommends. The, um, the, these decisions are up to the select board. So you you have the authority to uh, modify this draft if if um, if you think there's a more appropriate limit or you want to change something. You have the authority to make revisions. I think if it's a huge wholesale revision, then we need to think about another public hearing, but the statute does not limit your ability to make changes. So I just wanted to make that point. And um, I won't speak for the Planning Commission, but this, this, is, uh, this is basically a recommendation that you, you have the authority to discuss, obviously discuss it, take comment, and then uh, if you want to change something, that's certainly within your purview before you consider adoption. Well, I also understand that, uh, you know, we have to be sensitive of the planning commission's um, hard work here, um, not overstep too far. Uh, can I, can I comment? Can, can sure, I comment? Can. Absolutely, can. Sure. Yep. Well, um, we certainly appreciate uh, the uh, select board um, being sensitive to the concerns of the commission. Um, but as Steve mentioned, this is interim zoning and formally the planning commission doesn't under state law it doesn't even have an official role in the adoption of interim zoning that said uh, we understand all the discussions that took place and and how the select board wanted to get input from the planning commission so that still stands having said that the concern from the planning commission standpoint over the limitation of size of buildings is that um the this zoning district is essentially as a mixed use zoning district so you can't really think of it in terms of whether it's just strictly a commercial building whether it's a restaurant or some retail use or an industrial zoning district um, there are also single family homes in this zoning district there are historic structures that go back you know, decades and decades that are a, a core part of the, you know, the, the, the built environment of downtown. So um, that requires some sort of a balancing act. If this were a single or a more narrowly defined zoning district in terms of the types of uses allowed, it would be, um, uh, it would be a different ball game. But um, we had some particular concern, you know, Mary Cohen, who's not here tonight, um, who lives in the village and owns a home in the village. She had some real concerns about making sure that that size limit was not too great because of its potential effect on those existing residences. So that was really the discussion and the thinking that took place with the Planning Commission. Um, so I've, I have a question. I don't know if it necessarily applies, but, um, you know, existing businesses or existing buildings, um, uh, that are currently operating under, uh, certain types of businesses. I, I know from, uh, permitting process through act 250 and, and, um, you know, land management plans by the state things are constantly a moving target, stormwater issues, constantly evolving. And in my particular business, if I'm, you know, abiding by those standards one year and then the following year up, oh, what we had last year has been changed and no longer applies. Now you've got to shift gears and comply to these new standards. Uh, that can be difficult. Sometimes, you know, and, and you get frustrated because you're you're abiding by what what the state has put forward and all of a sudden, boom, they throw a wrench out of left field and uh, 
kind of knock you off your horse and um, and you got to go back to square one and start over and it can become costly and and uh, time consuming and I'm wondering if there's uh, any instances in town that would be impacted uh, and maybe derailed or have to kind of step back and regroup and move forward again uh, how are those addressed is there any type of grandfathering clause um, how, do, how do those types of situations get addressed well Chris Vermont state law is is pretty clear cut on this issue is once somebody gets a permit under a set of regulations they get to rely on that permit even if the permit was approved in error a zoning administrator or a drb could make the wrong decision and the applicant still gets to rely on that permit so if somebody has a permit today to do something that somehow might not be approved under these interim bylaws they can act on that permit uh, if somebody has an existing facility, they get to continue to operate that facility. If they have an existing building uh, or a permit to build a building, they get to rely on that permit and they have that. So those things that are that have been approved and or are on the ground, those get to continue. Um, even if they were to become non-conforming potentially under this new zoning, I don't know that there would be any instances, but but just in the abstract, that's, you know, Vermont state law is very clear on that issue. Bill. Yeah, to that point, as, te as Ken was talking, I was, I was wondering exactly that about non-conforming uses. And, you know, Ken uh, made a good point that this is a district that has a lot of variety in it in terms of its current uses. But I think we, also can't lose track of the fact that we have some pretty big buildings that are in this district now. Um, I believe the, uh, the shopping center that Pomelo owns where Village Market is, is in this district. So uh, you can't put Village Market out of business, but I guess a question would be if, if they wanted to expand that building, if Village Market wanted to expand and put in another, you know, 10,000 square feet and, you know, push out into the parking lot to the left of the building, um, all things being equal, could they, could they do that under, under this bylaw? Um, I also think that we have to give a little consideration, and I didn't think of this before, but, um, you know, part of this district uh, on Bidwell Lane and on Foundry Street are currently industrially zoned areas now. So if Sunges Oriental Foods wanted to expand, they could move into the whole building on Foundry Street that they're in under the industrial regulations. They could take up every bit of space in that building. And if you pass this bylaw, then, I mean, just as it is, I think Sunges would be restricted to no more than 4,000 square feet. And, you know, um, that's not really about the non-conforming uses, but I, I was as, as you were talking, and that's why I asked Steve about the map earlier. Um, is there a way that you can include in this interim bylaw um, uh, how do I want to put it? Um, some language that would enable existing uses currently allowed in a particular zoning district to, to exist. For example, I wrote down for properties in the downtown zoning district as determined by this interim bylaw, which are in the current industrial zone, all uses and dimensional requirements described in the permanent bylaw would be allowed in addition to these new ones. And, you know, maybe I'm, I'm trying to cast too wide of a net, but we don't have a lot of industrial areas in, in town. And we certainly don't have a lot of industrial buildings that are available to be used. And if we, I just don't want to end up 
turning off the spigot for a business that's already in place and they can't expand into the next part of a building. So that, that, that's, 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 my, that's my concern too as well, Bill. That's why I didn't know if there was a, some form of a grandfathering scenario that could be put in place. Um, you know, one of the thoughts I had, hang on, Mike, just a second. Uh, one of the thoughts I had is, you know, this downtown district, we're pretty limited as far as available space to uh, expand. So at some point, I think outside of tearing structures down and, and rebuilding, um, we're going to work ourselves out of the room here pretty for too long. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, I mean, if there was a way of meeting, meeting, letting the current buildings operate under the current sizes that they are and the businesses they want to expand into another section of it um, as an existing building is that possible and then let's say somebody decides well I don't want that building it's I'm going to rebuild it and tear it down then they would fall under the new guidelines go ahead Bill you were going to say something what I was going to say my initial when I was talking to myself about the potential loss of this industrial district was you know, maybe we just carve those two streets off and just leave them zoned industrial. And I don't have the permanent bylaws in front of me and I don't know what the use is allowed there, but my guess is that something like housing maybe is not allowed in the, the industrial district. So I was trying to figure out a way to get, to allow both, you know, to allow the uses that this new district would allow in these areas, let's say somebody wanted to put housing in where the stone shed is, for example. Uh, I, I mean, I can't imagine that in that current building, but let's just say that somebody decided they could do that. You know, I, I wouldn't want to preclude them from doing it, but on the other hand, if an industrial use wanted to use that space, I wouldn't want them limited to 4,000 square feet. So I was wondering if there was a way that you could craft some language, and I'm not good enough to do it on the fly, and I'm not sure it's even uh, reasonable to consider, but that's why I was trying to say, let these buildings do what's allowed in this new district, but if they were formally zoned industrial, let those uses and dimensional requirements apply just for those, for the buildings in that district, but uh, that might be too big of an ask, I'm not sure. Mike? Yeah, Chris, you and Bill both really stole my thunder, so I don't want to regurgitate what you both have said, but I think I really do want to hear from the public about this size restriction. I do like Bill's kind of thing is that you may want to look at some uses that ha are already permitted possible now to continue on to be, you know, permitted. You know, I think we want to be open and it's what's what's OK today is not OK. Tomorrow is going to be it's 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 a real property rights kind of issue. But I do I want to hear from the public. See what they think restrictions. Do we want to open it up? Do we want to have some sort of grandfathering? You know, what's the public's pleasure on this issue? Yeah, I see Mike there, Mike's phone. Um... You had a comment there, but I didn't get the whole thing because it cut off there. So if you want to jump in there, and then Wendy, she also had a comment as well. And it looks like she's up again. So Mike, if you want to jump in first, uh, you can come on on audio and let us know what your thoughts are. This is Amy Anderson. Sorry, we're sharing a phone. <laughs> okay. Go um, ahead, Amy. Yeah, we just um, wanted to know if this was the only opportunity for testimony and if there were um, a highlighted version of the changes so that we could see what the changes are specifically. It's hard to follow. There's a lot to digest. Um, and, you know, I just haven't had an opportunity to print them and side by side and all that. Um, so I wondered if there was a, a you know, highlighted draft version so we could just look at only the changes because that's you know the only thing we need to focus on and then the other um question was if we're going to um, have a higher reliance on the site plan review process and a lot of this is changing and there's going to be a lot of questions from people is there going to be something 
um, defining a reasonable expectation of response time to questions, emails, phone calls, so that you can know what it is you're supposed to apply for and it doesn't, you know, delay actions. Go ahead, Steve. Um, just real quick, um, Amy, um, <clears throat> this is um, basically uh, entirely new from the existing zoning bylaws. It's based on the proposed unified development bylaw that's been, been under discussion by the uh, Planning Commission for a few years. Um, it's similar to the draft that went to a public hearing on February 22nd. There have been some changes, uh, but there we don't have them highlighted since that draft. So the, it really is a wholly new draft that um, is is before you. Uh, okay, Whitney. Think, yep. No um, I've got a couple of questions that I just put in the chat. I don't necessarily need to um, have them answered right now. I just thought that they were little um, details that I was hoping to have sorted out. Maybe I could just respond to one of Whitney's question about music. Um, music is uh, indoor music for restaurants and other facilities is regulated under our entertainment ordinance, not our zoning bylaws. So this draft basically states that um, any uh, entertainment, whether it's indoors or outdoors, requires an entertainment permit to be approved by the select board. I did catch that in your chat. Thanks. Is that something new requirement or um, is no, that already it's been in existence for a while? Thank you. Mark Fryer. You're muted. You're muted, my friend. I'll, I'll start with the 5,000 square foot limitation. Um, as many people know, I've been working for years trying to entice the idea of getting development of more residential downtown. And, you know, constantly we talk about the sprawl of the hillsides and how we can avoid that. And I think this goes, this, these regs go a long way to help that with the density changes that are being made. But I do have uh, concerns that I mentioned at the last meeting, but since the planning commission is here as well, I, I, I think it's a point. So I really do think the 5,000 is too small. Um, I hope the planning commission on the regulations that go beyond this um, could even be more than what I'm proposing, but I really do think that 10,000 is more appropriate. I think I sat in meetings for over five years in the steel block building talking about that boundary um, building that Bill mentioned a lot as a potential opportunity for some new development of housing. And we've been talking with trying to get uh, engage the local housing partnership to try to do a project there. Um, that's a 12,000 square foot footprint. And you, what basically what happened is if you go to knock that down, you would end up having to build multiple towers and more walls, more exterior walls mean more cost and most likely won't at least entice an outside developer to even consider it. Um, I think there's multiple buildings that are over 5,000 square feet. I understand concern about a, a single family resident being concerned about the building of downtown, but I think one of the goals here is to push density into the downtown and try to limit sprawl. And I think that that limitation right there will keep us a town that can't handle the housing demand and will continue to hold us back from hopefully getting developers in here to, to do some more residential projects in a downtown. There's a younger generation that doesn't want to have cars. And I really think that we need to consider raising that number. Um, while I have the mic, my other issue obviously is what's been mentioned. Um, I have an industrial building in this space that's gonna be rezoned under these rules because of the map change. I have a brewery that's about to sign a lease on a 2,500 square foot space. I originally talked about they maybe can grow into the whole building, but now they won't be able to. And so I really think those limitations are gonna affect only a few of us, but I'm one of them. And the number 10 and number 11 having a limit on 4,000 square feet when my main floor is 10,000. So I could have two breweries of 4,000 square feet, but I couldn't have one brewery of eight. I just don't think it's, it's unfortunately not working for my building. I'm happy to hear some solutions, but I do really want to reiterate that that's not, I mean, it devalues my building and it, it really does affect me. And I'm really trying to be, I want to see this happen. I think there's a lot of good here. I just need some answers on solutions on that stuff. Steve, what's the footprint of the steel block? Oh, 
I'll look that up for you, Bill. Yeah, I think Mark, Mark, to my point there, that's why I was wondering if there's some kind of a grandfathering clause there that could be implemented that would cover buildings of your size and, and just allow growth with inside the building without, without uh, you know, having to meet the current draft um, because they're existing buildings and existing square footages. Go ahead, Steve, are you gonna answer? Well, yeah, I, Chris, I think we can have some more conversation once you've taken the public comment, but I, I think that's really problematic. I think um, non-conforming uses can be accepted, but if they're gonna expand, that, that can be an issue. So um, I think the alternative either leaving the three buildings on Foundry Street in the industrial district, I think that try to accommodate special circumstances with special language is really gonna be problematic. So let's, let's have some more discussion after the public comment. I think George McCain's been waiting for a little while, Chris. He might want to, okay. he's had his hand raised. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I couldn't see your hand. All I can see is your picture, George. Okay. If you got something you'd like to say, go right ahead. No worries, no, I, I had the little hand emoji up there. But no, I was gonna speak to the same 5,000 square foot issue there. Um, something Steve mentioned at the beginning kind of resonated, which was that there wasn't a maximum density for uh, housing because it was, you know, this is all undergoing site plan review and it's really what the site can support and seeing what's going down through there. So I think putting an arbitrary 5,000 square foot maximum, if you've got a site that could support more, um, isn't necessarily beneficial. Thanks. Alyssa. I just want to acknowledge that I'm occupying kind of an awkward space, um, which is to say that I've worked with the planning commission thus far, but was not obviously part of the board during this drafting. Um, I did mention at two of the previous meetings, I'm also a resident on South Main Street in the downtown district. And I also have concerns about the 5,000 square foot maximum footprint, mostly from a housing development perspective. I just think there's opportunities um, at like 51 South Main Street, if that was to become housing um, or the stone shed and that that just becomes restrictive. So I'd love to see, I recognize it's a tough balance um, because it is both a commercial and industrial, but I think there's housing projects like Joel Baker's project in my neck of the woods, which I understand is outside this interim zoning district, but which is putting eight housing units in the downtown that I think is a really good thing. And I would hate to see something like a 5,000 square foot max footprint um, make it so projects like that can't happen in the future. But I really applaud the Planning Commission for the work. I'm excited. I know some of this can be revised going forward, but just another community member with some concerns about that 5,000 square foot max threshold for a whole building. So I'm certainly not talented enough to come up with a solution to uh, <laughs> this problem. Um, I don't know if it's gonna require some more uh, thought process by the planning commission in the select board. Tonight's meeting is gonna be able to get us to the solution that we're looking for. Or, okay. I, I have a comment, Chris, if I could. Again, go ahead. Um, so, so back in the in the old days when I was still working um, in Williston, we had a situation where we had a proposed down zoning in a zoning district that had a whole collection of uh, existing and 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 fairly well planned industrial buildings, and they were going to become non-conforming uses and I, I was not the the author of that but um uh, the staff we were charged with trying to come up with a solution it seems like it's similar to this and the solution that i came up with at, at the time was that um if you had an industrial building that had an approved site plan um for industrial uses in other words, it all the building had already been permitted and it was designed to accommodate industrial uses. You would allow those uses to be able to utilize the building. I mean, it's a way of, of getting at the concern about somebody who's sitting in an existing house right now worried about a, a 
a big building that might dwarf them in an unacceptable way being built right next door to them. Um, so we know where these big buildings are right now. And that's a that's just off the top of my head. That's a you know a sort of solution that we came up with about 10 or so years ago. And you know it's something that the select board might want to consider um, as a sort of a stop gap or compromise measure on this question. Exactly what I was uh, trying to get at earlier, I think, uh, with this grandfathering thing. Danny, did you have something you wanted to say? Okay. Yeah, if anybody else had any comments, I'd take them uh, if I hadn't seen seen your hand or. Hey, Chris, uh, real quick, Tom, Lord, just a question about infrastructure. I mean, I, I, I hear the discussion about increasing size square foot, whatnot, we want to build more housing, affordable housing, all these discussions, but Water Bay has an infrastructure, right? I mean, are we looking at a strategy that the infrastructure supports, or are we now starting to scale outside of what the existing infrastructure could support? And, and the reason I asked the question, I mean, I'm we've got the downtown district that's been largely rebuilt, will we'll be complete, I'm assuming on time. Uh, but we have roads that are not exactly up to par. In increased travel in town, you've got to be looking at infrastructure in water, sewer, roads. Square footage has got to play out in this. A small town can scale to, to a degree, but Who's looking at that plan? I, I don't know the details on it, but I believe that the wastewater system has been uh, reconstructed and, and has plenty of capacity. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, um, and our water system's in pretty good shape. Uh, the buildings that are currently existing in the village I think the infrastructure that we have can certainly support anything that's would come about as as far as uh, businesses in those buildings at this at this time. Um, no, I understand existing, but what we're talking about is bylaws that would be good for two years with one year extension possible that would fold into. I, I'm assuming the bylaws are going to be nearly 90%, if not higher, of what would be a rewrite. You're not gonna change all of a sudden three years from now. So if we're talking to growth from, from 4,000 up to 5,000 to 10,000, whatever that number is, I mean, that, that discussion happening now, I think is a little problematic if someone's not looked at scale of supporting that type of density. And existing is, that's what it was built for. What what is the density that we're going to? There's no there's no issue with density in the downtown district, frankly, anywhere in the former village of Waterway. Uh, we have a very adequate water supply with uh, significant capacity for additional customers. Uh, we have a wastewater treatment facility right now that's probably running about 20% of its capacity. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we can't expand necessarily beyond the district where water and sewer lines already exist very easily, especially on the sewer side. But in terms of providing service and being able to uh, accommodate 5,000, 10,000 square foot buildings that might have, you know, uh, 25 um, apartments in it or whatever, uh, there, there's no issue with that. Industrial uses, commercial uses, all in the former village. Uh, we've got plenty of capacity in water and sewer uh, right now. Mark, did you have some additional you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to also comment and remind everyone that we currently don't have a limit on building size in this district. So this is new, and I do think that there needs to be additional discussion. Um, but we, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we have a limit currently. And also the consultants did not 
suggest we have a limit on size in the downtown district. So I, I don't disagree that we shouldn't have a limit, but I do think the 5,000 is just really small. And I think we should consider at least 10,000, um, at least for now. And then hopefully when the planning commission can meet and talk about goals and density, that maybe those numbers are, you know, maybe it's even more than 10, maybe not much more, but I do think that 10 is reasonable in this district and we currently don't have one. Yep. Chris, that is correct. We, we currently don't have a limit. This is something that's um, new that the Planning Commission recommended to, to address issues of scale. And, um, the, one of the comments from the um, Whatever Area Development Committee also was to increase that maximum building footprint to um, eight or 10,000 square feet. They recommended 10, but we're willing to um, compromise, if you will, at 8,000. So that was a comment that they made, as you probably recall. Well, we're a little past our time for holding this public hearing, um, unless somebody's got something outstanding that uh, gonna sway the board one way or the other at this point. Um, I think we need to uh, adjourn the public hearing and put the select board and the planning commission up Chris, a little you, bit. Of could you just, uh, before you adjourn, so I guess I, I didn't hear, I heard the first part of this and there's a lot of discussion about the 4,000 and the, and the other requirements. What I just heard though, was there is no limit on the size, this would be setting a limit. So why then was the planning commission Gearing towards these numbers, what what was the driving factor with the numbers that you put pen to paper on? I think Ken kind of touched on that earlier. Um, we just hear it one more time because um. Well, he explained that the, there's so many uh, different types of structures within the village that uh, I think Ken, you can correct me that uh, your concern was uh, maybe allowing too big of a square footage would impact some of the residential housing and uh, other smaller homes within the village area. And you're just trying to create some type of scenario where everybody coincides together kind of on a level playing field, more yeah, or that's, less. That's, that's correct. The other thing that I would point out is that the boundaries of this zoning district are different than the zoning district boundaries as they exist today. So you have uh, a consolidation of some zoning districts. And so it, it changes the, it literally changes the playing field um, because you have a, you, you now have a mix of uses in this proposed zoning district that you don't have today. Um, but the, you know, as you stated, Chris, that the concern um, which came from some members of the commission and it was, you know, it was agreed on was there was some concern about large new buildings that might come in and create a situation that would be incompatible with especially existing residential, uh, re residential buildings in the zoning district. Okay, if nobody else has got any comments, I think we'll close out the public hearing for now. And, uh, Mike, Chris, go ahead. Before we go on, I don't think we addressed uh, that. And maybe if Steve and Ken want to comment, there was a comment by Whitney about bulk storage. If if either one of you could comment on that. Uh, I know this comment of. Did you want to say something, Ken? No, I'll go for it. I was pointing to you. That's what I was doing. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so as I recall, the bulk storage had to do with uh, multifamily dwelling. Um, and Whitney, maybe maybe you could speak up. I know this comment came up before that um, that it just has to do with the amount of uh, storage space for uh, for dwelling units. It's not intended for refuse or other uh, kinds of materials. I'm trying to remember. Whitney, maybe maybe it'd be best if you gave us a section. Section 170712, Steve. 
1607 one, two. Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is under multifamily dwelling. Um, so this has to do with the amount of uh, storage space that's designated within a building for a dwelling unit. And um, it's providing a, um, a minimum amount. So envision a building that has some storage um, uh, cages, if you will, in a basement. So it's saying, okay, you got to have at least so much per unit. And, um, and it could be separate from the dwelling unit and accessory, like a garage structure or something like that. And um, has to be access accessible. Uh, so it's not really dealing with um, where an apartment would put something like trash or refuse, some, something of that nature. So yeah. I'm sorry, you know, I am um, owner of Axles and a resident, but I'm thinking a little outside of the box of where I'm currently at right now. But um, if I were to build a multi-residence somewhere in the floodplain, which happens to be in downtown, because part of the downtown is within the floodplain, if I'm required to have this bulk storage requirement, then that means I'm going to be displacing more water throughout the town. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't there... Um, a rule when you're building in the floodplain in Waterbury right now that if you displace X amount of water, you actually have to take that same X amount of um, area away from your property to equalize the impact. That's correct, right, Steve? That's correct. Or have a uh, vented crawl space like you and Wade have, or the fire station has vented garage space. So there, there can be ways to accommodate storage. Um, so say have to if, say the got it. So say if the stone shed, because that's in the floodplain, is and so is part of Crispin's um, uh, screen printing building. Those buildings are partly in the floodplain. Are we are we setting them up for you know additional requirement? I mean, this is a tiny detail, but when it comes to having to equalize that i guess that net change every 20 square foot is important i suppose and if if it's more than a five unit residence then it you know then it becomes it come, becomes bigger i just wonder if that's really necessary well yeah well it's a four by five foot footprint area per unit so it's i, I don't know that it would have a huge um Right, but so, it also doesn't it, the the storage you you can build a, you know the storage doesn't have to be on the ground floor in in the floodplain. I mean, I think the point of the floodplain regulations are going to make you develop the property, especially if it's a, a a new development in a fashion that won't be in the floodplain and won't cause those problems. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on the ground floor. You can put the storage in the attic if you want. Yeah, and you, you can actually, um, that probably wouldn't be advisable, but you can put storage in a, uh, a garage space or an area which, which, is, which can, could be flooded. That's, that's acceptable as well. So there, there are definitely some options. Yeah, you just take the risk of, yeah, of getting wet. That's true. Okay, I see Ryan Miller had a comment here. Uh, if you want to jump on real quick and in, in uh, on audio there and ask your comment again, uh, maybe we can address it real quick, and then we got to close this meeting out. Public hearing, I mean. You all set, Ryan? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I stepped away for a minute. I didn't hear you. Okay, well, you had a comment there. If you'd like to express that on audio, I'd appreciate it uh yeah i guess i was just kind of assuming that the uh the wastewater department would be the the ones that would be uh kind of dictating the size or the scale of of the building just based on the load that they can handle um i don't really know i was just kind of like throwing that out there yeah as bill had expressed there just a few minutes ago the, the wastewater system is currently at about a 20 percent capacity so you got 80 percent capacity to Right, and that seems pretty Still you, so that it's going to take some time to fill that. Yeah, yeah but we, we, we've been told that we need to really like sidestream 100% of our waste. 
so, so as not to overload that. You know, we're we're on board to do that, but who's talking and what are you talking about? <laughs> I think they're yeah. talking about biological oxygen demand, Bill, organics. Yeah, that's just yeah. that's just my partner. She's she's talking she's talking about uh the discussion we had with the uh wastewater department, but uh I, I was just you know, I was just throwing that out there as an assumption because, uh, you know, I, I, to me, it's a confusing as to why the, uh, you know, planning commission and DRB would be uh, deciding on what, you know, amount of load the uh, waste department can handle um, based on the size of the structure. And I, I just, I just wanted to throw that out there. That's all. Well, there's a very big difference between um, you know, industrial uses. I, I'm not sure who you are. We haven't met. I don't know if you're a brewer or what the situation is, but you know, that's a very different type of waste than domestic waste, you know, which comes from apartments, houses, um, commercial retail establishments. Uh, so we don't have any issue with regard to uh, the ability to handle wastewater when it comes to those types of those types of uh, situations. Uh, if you're talking about industrial waste or waste from food processing plants, the, the, the Edward Fry Utility District has an ordinance that you know requires pretreatment. Uh, you know it should not be up to the municipality to do all the treatment of a very particular um, waste uh, that is generated by a particular business. So Ben and Jerry's, for example, they have a whole lagoon system up there that they, they pre-treat their dairy waste before it gets sent to the, gets sent to the wastewater treatment facility. And uh, you know the, the brewery that uh, um, is up in Colbyville, they have to do pre-treatment of, of their waste. So those very specific High concentration wastes, yeah, there, there's uh, additional regulations, but with regard to standard um, hydraulic capacity, uh, we don't have an issue in waterway with that right now. Right, yeah, no, I, I totally understand. I was just uh, just wondering why it would be up to the planning commission and stuff to uh, dictate like what the square footage footprint is of a building. Um, when I feel like the, I, I honestly feel like the waste uh, what is it, the public work should be part of these meetings to kind of like uh, they they are they are I I I work on the town I'm the manager for the for the utility district this is nothing that's new this is something that the the um, water and sewer commissioners are well aware of this this is not being done without uh, input or any of their concerns expressed. And I think the planning commission, they're, they're, not, they're not recommending square footage requirements having anything to do with uh, water or sewer capacity or wastewater. Their, their, their recommendations, and Ken can co correct me if I'm wrong, but their recommendations are more, like, more on an aesthetic basis in terms of what the character of the community looks like. Uh, mm. it's, it's not a wastewater issue for the planning commission. Yeah, yeah. it's been expressed differently in the past. So so we're just, you know, wondering about that. But that's fine. That's wonderful to hear. I guess what I would add from a planning commission standpoint is the only discussions that we've had about wastewater is simply that in the permitting process, um, an applicant would have to demonstrate that they have secured adequate water and wastewater treatment capacity to support the use. Uh, there are some parts of town that are served by on-site septic. And, you know, if you want to develop a parcel of land, it's outside of the sewer service area, you know, you show that you have a water and wastewater discharge permit approved by the state of Vermont for your septic system. If you're in the village, this zoning district, which is supported by the um, the municipal water and sewer district, um, you show some documentation that the district can provide adequate capacity. And that's it. And, and then it goes through the permitting process, whether it gets approved as a, uh, a 
garden variety permitted use by the zoning administrator or whether it's approved by the development review board, but neither of those processes pass muster on whether the sewer system has adequate capacity. The sewer system provides documentation that they have adequate capacity and a willingness and ability to serve the proposed use. And then it gets tied into the permit, but that's it. And those, those are the only discussions that we've had on that. Right on, thank you for the, uh, the clarity, appreciate it. Okay, well, once again, uh, probably should close this meeting out and uh, go back to the select board meeting and uh, hope the planning commission kind of stays on board here. We can hash these uh, comments out and uh, try to come to a solution tonight. So thanks everybody for attending that wanted to attend the public meeting and uh, turn this meeting back over to Mark if he, uh, I don't think I can. I don't think I can carry on this part. Okay. Very well. Then we'll close out the meeting, um, and uh, the select board meeting will resume. Okay. Uh, <laughs> next steps here. Katie, I'm heard a board boo from you tonight, uh, or Danny for that matter. How about some input? I asked my questions last week um, to Mark's group about their specific wanting for the um, for having 10,000 square feet instead of the five. And I think they answered that tonight more in detail. So that was good. Um, and I think all my other questions that I really had were answered. So that's just my input. And I'm just, anybody else? Amy? I did indeed ask a question, but I appreciate giving some space. Um, so I am curious about, um, you know, processes to the next step of how we go about proposing and making changes before adopting the bylaws. Um, that's just not something I've done before, so I'm curious about that. And then um, I, I am I'm unsure if this question has been answered, but with the square footage, is it is it something that we could change to have the five thousand as permitted and and moving up to ten thousand as conditional? Um, and I don't know, um, you know, what the what the details are there, but if that's something that's possible, it's something I'd be curious to explore. Steve, want me to speak to that, Chris? Yes, yeah. please. So, Danny, um, in um, response to your first question on process, um, interim bylaws are different than um, regular bylaws or, or permanent bylaws in that the select board can make substantive changes to the draft prior to adoption. So uh, you do have that authority. We, we check with our attorney and, uh, and that, that is the case with interim bylaws. It's not the case with uh, regular bylaws. Uh, once we get to that stage, if you make a substantive change, uh, you have to warn a, another second public hearing on that draft. So that's the answer to the process. Uh, you could certainly change a square foot figure, a threshold or a, um, you know, We've talked a lot about maximum building footprint and uh, upper limits for uh, three of the uses. You know, those figures are something that, that you could change. It would be a substantive change, but you can do that prior to adoption without holding a subsequent public hearing. Um, let's see, the second part of your question, just remind me, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired. That's okay. Um, I'm curious if um, a change for the, um for the footprint sizing, if it's something that could be done to leave the existing um, okay. limit of 5,000 as permitted and then up to 10,000 as conditional and what kind of pros and cons there are to doing something like that. Okay, Th thank you. Yes, I have a problem. So um, yeah, Chris and I talked about this question as well. So dimensional requirements, which th this maximum building footprint is a so-called dimensional requirement like setbacks, building height, uh, so on. So, um, that, um, so that is, is not a use. Uh, uses are the um, area where you can set a threshold between the permitted and conditional use. So I think the answer is, is, um, is no. You, the way this is structured, um, the use can have a limit of size, like this draft has a limit on, on like an upper limit on size. But um, the building footprint would, if you're going to um, 
continue with that recommendation, it needs to have a one figure for all situations. An existing building can certainly continue in its current configuration, but um, the, the question came up about expanding that building. That would raise question if it was beyond the, the limited footprint. So um, it becomes problematic when you're over that limit in various situations. Does that answer your question? Thank you, it does. So Chris, Pro oh, Mike wants to say something, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Oh, well, I'll just say process-wise, I think, um, you know, you may want to have some discussion if, um, if you want to try to come up with modifications to this draft. Um, I'll just say one thing about the area of um, Foundry Street. There are three buildings there, uh, 35 Foundry, which is the Stone Shed, uh, 30 Foundry, which is where Finland uh, Silk Screen and Makersphere is, and then um, Mark's building at 40 Foundry. Those are the ones that are currently in the industrial district. So I think the two options there, if you want to try to accommodate larger size, are either to take put those areas back into the industrial district uh, in terms of the mapping uh, or to, uh, and residential use would not be allowed in that case, um, or to, uh, if you wanted to accommodate larger size uh, replacement building or, uh, or use would be to change those, um, those limits in terms of square feet. So those, those I think are the two options there, but process wise, you may want to have some discussion if you want to try to um, make some changes to this draft and get it um, and, and move towards adoption. Uh, Bill, you, you may want to speak to that as well. I know there's some, um, some aspects of urgency about trying to get um, a draft through the adoption process, but um, I won't speak to that. I think you're on mute, Bill. On everything that's been said, uh, and even though I like Ken's language a lot about those industrial uses being allowed, um, you know, if there's any real concern about this, I would, I think, I would recommend that maybe the select board would remove Foundry Street from this district and leave it zoned industrial. Uh, I know we would like to have the ability to have housing in industrial zones. The planning commission is going to be tackling the rest of the bylaws. You know, they're, they're continuing to work on this. Um, there's still an opportunity for that discussion to be had. Frankly, I don't, it seems unlikely to me that in the next two years, there's a significant chance of any real uh, movement towards um, housing projects on Foundry Street, in the Stone Shed in particular, there's a lot of issues with that building. Um, and, you know, we've already had some discussions with the state. Uh, they're in the process right now of removing Stanley and Wasson Hall. Uh, that might be an area that uh, we can work with Downstreet or some other organization for replacement buildings on, on that site that, you know, the state has given some consideration to uh, carving that um, particular portion of the, of the lot off that could be redeveloped there. Uh, 51 South Main Street is vacant right now and it's, it's being used for parking during the uh, Main Street reconstruction for replacement parking. But given the expansion of the TV bank lot, um, there's a lot you know, more spaces behind the Congregational Church and the and the old Mount the Mansfield Orthopedic uh, facility. Um, it, it, you know that's another place that's a possibility for some uh, housing to happen. So I think if we're if we're just going to put this Foundry Street uh, properties in this district for the purposes of allowing maybe housing. I, I really don't think in the next two years that's a big issue. And if the planning commission addresses housing in the industrial districts for the permanent bylaw, then 
it could be included there then. So I, I think maybe that the industrial zone should stay industrial if that's um, all the, if, if housing is the only issue that is kind of driving it toward be considered in this downtown district, I wouldn't worry about it, but. Your, to your point, Bill and Steve, um, when you mentioned taking that Founder Street out of the district, that immediately made the best sense for me. And I just wanna kinda uh, reestablish the point that I think part of the downtown density growth consists of two main things. It consists of enter uh, housing um, areas, but also businesses that those people that live in those houses can walk to. And if we make it difficult for those businesses to establish in at least a couple of areas in the downtown, um, I kind of we're defeating our purpose. So I think uh, to take Foundry Street out of the district right now gives us a couple of years to uh, focus on maybe what's more appropriate for that area. And uh, we don't make a knee jerk reaction and uh, approve the wrong thing tonight. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And I also think you should give some deference to, and I, I know, you know, Mark has recused himself, um, and, but he's, he's spoken up a little bit in defense of his own properties. But I also, I think that the select board needs to give serious consideration to the issues that have been raised by some of the property owners and developers that 5,000 square feet and, and maybe the, you know, some of the limitations on the usage of the square footage in this new district is a little small. Um, you know, I, I understand the, the, the concern about the single family houses. And again, I'm not in a position to say it's never going to happen, but the development that most of it's been driving most of this has been in the true core, you know, Main Street between um, the fire station and and the Congregational Church and Stowe Street and Bidwell Lane to a degree. Um, you know, is Alec Tuscany and, you know, uh, Jane Grace, are they going to, you know, knock down that house there at the corner of Park Row and build a a uh, 10,000 square foot building, it seems very unlikely. And uh, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish the concerns. I mean, Ann Imhoff, she was on a while ago. I mean, she lives right in the center of this district. And I understand that, you know, people do have concerns about being dwarfed, but I think that getting some of the uh, density, you guys know better than I do, uh, with building costs today, the cost of materials, you know, if you can, if you can get a, a bigger footprint and do a little bit more with those same amount of materials, I think it's, it's probably beneficial. So um, I, I think that I've heard a lot of the testimony that you all have heard that the 5,000 square foot limitation seems small, but you know, it's, understand I understand why it was presented that way and it's it's I don't get a vote so and I don't know when any property down there so I I don't really have a big uh, I don't have a lot of skin in the game so I don't mean to pass the buck to you folks but it's really your choice but I think those things need to be considered Bird. yes I have I I agree with a lot of what the consensus has been here I think it's a would be a good idea to take Foundry Street out because I'm very hesitant to take away property owners' rights that they have right now. And just especially if we're going to be looking at longer term, you know, permanent bylaws, which, which can be changed. So it can allow for housing development or something. I too have concerns about, you know, the certain square footage. I'm a little bit, you know, I can 
could go back and forth between the eight and 10,000 uh, square foot level. But I also think that, you know, whatever level we put, say if we have up to 10,000, I'm a firm believer in trusting our DRB. They're making good decisions on internal use. It's not a granted. So, you know, the, the DRB will be our sounding board to say this is not a reasonable request. This is going to affect the existing uh, homeowners and going to try to protect their rights. I don't think, you know, we're the any of these commissions are here just to take away people's rights. I think there there is a buffer. I think as as everyone has said, there's there's a need for larger development than you know the four or five thousand square foot level because that in in the downtown district is relatively small. And if you're going to build something, as Bill said, you know, the cost to build a little bit bigger is not that much more. My thoughts. What are you proposing, Mike? Excluding. Now that, now that you've stepped out I'm there, let's hear it. Ex excluding the Founders Street area and keeping, and keeping it in the, um, in the industrial zone and going to a 10,000 10, 10, square foot uh, conditional use for, you know, development. And what triggers that conditional use? What square footage, is there a square footage point that then stepped you into that? 10,000 for, for, the, for the few items, for the few different uses, you know, the food and beverage, the light industrial, that have been mentioned, you know, you know, given the maximum square foot footage up to, you know, for those ones that are totally limited, go up to $10,000 with a decision going to the DRB. They, I, I trust that they're going to make good sound decisions. And if there is a significant impact, it's going to have to be either scaled back or uh, their permit denied. Well, Go ahead, Bill. Steve. I don't know if I missed. I don't know if I missed something. I I thought the proposal that you're considering limits the footprint of a building to five thousand square feet. And Steve just talked about the fact that you can't make the footprint of the building conditional. So, are you proposing allowing buildings up to ten thousand square feet, Mike? I think that's the first step, isn't it, Steve? I'm I'm allowing. Uh, up to 10,000 square feet of existing structures. Maybe that's how I want to. So you want to take Founder Street out and then for right. what's left, allow up to 10,000. Exactly. Mike, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Say, yeah. say existing structures, what, what the limitation in the dimensional requirement is the maximum building footprint of whatever your figure, if you're going to say 10,000, but that would be for new buildings or an expanded building. Right. An existing building. Is, is that what you're speaking to? Yeah. I would actually look, you know, I almost wish we had more consideration where the example that was used of, you know, the village market building, if they want to expand, you know, that's significantly bigger, you know, that's going to become a problem there. And, and, and do I think that's a bad use? It might not be a very bad use. I think, you know, sometimes there has to be some consideration for, you know, a good project. You know, I'm not saying there's no square footage. I'm not, you know, we don't want to see a 300,000 square foot, you know, use. But, you know, I think the numbers that we're looking at are not that huge. Yeah, just say one thing real quick. There is a variance process. So right. if, let's say you set a limit of 10,000, whatever, 8,000 for a maximum building footprint. The shopping center could request a variance to expand and right. use hardship um, as an issue or what, address the criteria. That, that's a possibility. But I think it's been mentioned so many times by by folks, you know, the numbers that were you, you know, 5,000 square foot numbers are just too low. And I think we need to, you know, go higher on a conditional use. My opinion. Okay, so Mike, there are two different issues. I just want to repeat this <laughs> sure. so clear. 
So the maximum building footprint is a dimensional requirement. It doesn't uh, doesn't right. speak to conditional versus permitted use. The other limit is on the three uses: the food and beverage manufacturing, light industry, and the specialty school. So those right. are uses. So they are conditional uses at any level, and they have an upper limit on the size of the use. So that's right. where conditional use comes into play. So I don't know if you're suggesting it's, a different limit there, or I'm not, I don't quite follow. It, it's kind of putting the food and beverage, the light industrial on a similar footage to commercial. You know, I'm th thinking we should have one uniform standard. Okay, well, let, let me just address that. I, I think, uh, and you know, the planning commission members can and others can address this, but I think the, the reason why there's an upper limit only on those uses is that um, a brewery in particular can have a lot of impact. So you've got a mixed use area right. with residences. So um, I won't speak for the planning commission, but the idea of putting an upper limit is so you don't have a Ben and Jerry's or um, you know a larger brewery in the downtown. You limit the size of that use. So that so that's the concept um, behind right. that is to, is to limit. Uh, same with light industry. You can have light industrial industrial uses that can have a large impact. So I I just wanted to make that point. I just think either whether we decide on eight or ten thousand, I think. That would be those would be better numbers. Yeah, it's a lot to digest here. Um, that's, you know, on an earlier meeting, I think I asked if there was a way of proposing a square footage limit on a new build, new uh, business that came in, and then have a the ability to have a conditional use review in in like a two year time frame. Say a business goes in, it gets established, it starts operations, it works under its current square footage for two years, and then realizes that you know we could expand here and and be successful if we had another four thousand square feet. In order to do that, you then have to go to a conditional use uh, review. That that is where the judgments made as to whether or not they would. By expanding, create those impacts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so gives gives at least somebody the notion that yeah, I can go in there under this scenario and start and operate for for a two year period, and then decide then if I want to expand, uh, I'll have to go through a conditional use review. Um, and a, and a lot of their decision making is based on their business plan and what they perceive is going to happen down the road. Like anybody's business plan, you look forward to project out, and um, they can uh, almost, in some way, self determine whether or not they're going to create those impacts that are going to be denied uh, ahead of the game. Um, at least I would think you would have that ability, Steve. Yeah, let, let me just address that. And then I think you, a couple of the other select board members had um, comments or discussion. Uh, Chris. So conditional use is, is just that. It gives the development review board the ability to place conditions on development. Um, it's not a way that they can deny uh, the expansion of a business or limit the size of a business. That's that's where these other requirements uh, come into play. So um, the, the uses that we're talking about are conditional uses regardless of the size because the impacts of a, of a food or beverage manufacturing or light industrial use can have some pretty severe limits to the character of the area at any size. So that's what conditional use is for, to address noise, address um odor just these other uh, traffic other things of that nature so i think it's really important to think well um in these particular cases where do you want to where do you want to limit the scale and that's that's where this uh, upper limit 
uh, comes comes into play. But the Development Review Board can't deny a project based on typically based on conditional use. I guess in theory they could, but it's designed so they they can impose conditions that address impacts. That's what the review is for. So if an impact was, yeah, hang on just a second, Bill. If an impact was such that it was uh, deniable, you couldn't deny the permit. What you're well, saying, you'd could. have to find some way of mitigating it. They could. It's undue adverse impact. The, the, the board right. has to determine that the impacts do not have an undue adverse impact on the environment. That, that's the, kind of the standard, but it's a very high bar. So typically there are ways to mitigate noise, uh, odor, traffic that makes it so it's not an undue adverse impact. That's my point. No. Yeah, I was just going to say, as I said a minute ago, I think that this has all been, been good information, but I think we've heard a lot of testimony from the, the business community that yes, while they would love to do business in a particular location, they want to be in this district, but they also want to make sure that they have enough uh, scale to make it commercially, commercially viable. And I, I think that that is as important as just allowing it in there. If you allow something, but you restrict its size to the degree that nobody's going to do it, then don't even bother allowing it. And we've heard a lot of talk that 5,000 square feet or 4,000 square feet, whatever it is for these food um, production facilities is a little bit small. Um, the town has to be willing and able to step up as well. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, we've had some issues with the brewery at, you know, on, on Elm Street. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they came in, they presented, uh, permit application, they went through the process, they got an approval from the DRB, and then there were issues. And the town, frankly, did not uh, deal with those issues from an enforcement level uh, adequately. And I think that's the other part of the, this whole process is that not only do we have to be willing to have the DRB consider these things from the standpoint and, and put reasonable conditions on, once those conditions are in place, then we need to say, okay, we're going to hold your feet to the fire. And the business community has to understand that if you get a permit and it says you can do X, Y, and Z, and you can't have any outside storage, that when we come to them and say, hey, you've got outside storage, that's against your permit. We want you to remove it. And then they complain that, oh, we're you know, we're unfriendly to business. So we've got to have it both ways. We, we've got to be put reasonable restrictions there, but the business community has to be willing to live with those restrictions. And if they don't, they we need to say, okay, we're going to take you to court on this and not just keep kind of fumbling over it. And uh, that's a frustrating element to me. And it all costs money when you have to go to court cost money. You've got to pay for lawyers and uh, and they have to pay for lawyers and nobody likes it, but that's part of the process too. Well, that's I one of our downs. I advocate for a little bit larger based on what the business is say, uh, saying that they need to, to make a go of it, but then say, okay, now you have to play by the rules. Well, that's one of the downfalls of the municipality. Whenever they're Whenever our feet are held to the fire to try to make people comply, we always fall short. And that's because of not only money issues, but the, whatever rules are in place don't have enough teeth to, to force people to comply. I've said for years, I know being on the DRB, I think Bill hit it right on the head. If we want, if the DRB wants to make restrictions, we have to enforce them. And I know sometimes it's not going to be pretty situations, but, you know, that's how you keep, you know, quality of life type things, you know, going, you know, if, if you give someone a permit, say, Hey, these are the things that you have to live with, you know, and again, in a permit process, if they don't want to live by those agreements, 
You're just going to say, hey, we're, we're going to see you in court. You know, ultimately, that's what's going to happen. And we have to be willing to maybe do that. You know, and sometimes it only takes one example to say, hey, we truly, because I do believe, I hear what everyone in the public, I hear what the uh, planning commission has said, we want to have quality of life, but also we want to have economic development. And there's a real balance. And, you know, the key is, is that, in, you know, saying, hey, these are restrictions, what conditional uses are, we may not d deny your permit, we're going to say you have to do X, Y, Z to get your permit, and we're going to hold you you accountable to doing that. I don't know what else to say. Danny, yes. Yeah, so I we've talked a lot, and I think um, I'm curious about moving forward with looking at changes and whether we want to propose or how we do it. Um, changing the footprint, the permitting size. And then I'd also like to look at those conditional uses, the ones that Mark brought up, um, 10 and 11. Um, knowing that those are conditional, wondering how everyone feels about increasing those um, as we increase, if and as we increase the um, footprint size and or putting in language, um, like I think it was Ken who mentioned, putting in language for existing buildings and, and grandfathering, but I think we can do better on terminology, um, those existing buildings in. So I know that was kind of multifaceted, but those are all the things I'm wondering if we can move forward with. Well, you, you only need that language, Danny, if you decide to not remove Foundry Street from this Correct. Uh, bylaw. And I'll let Mark speak for himself, but I think the 10 and 11 issues really were more Boundary Street issues, mm -hmm. as opposed to the rest of the district, but I, I don't want to presume that. Bill, are they just Boundary Street issues? Well, I, I can, I'm, ask, I'm asking. I'm asking. I don't think. Yeah, I think I could see other places where we could run up against other other than Boundary Street. Mark, you wanted to say something there, bud? Oh yeah, I just I heard you guys mentioning the idea of. I mean, that was one thing that I had asked Steve about removing my building from the map just because of these changes. But if you did the terminology that of something like Ken mentioned, I would be in support of not changing the map, making sure that I could take a single tenant in these uses and allow them to grow into my existing commercial building. Um, partially because I really do think the Foundry Street, um, whatever, the, what's that one called? The, the big one? Yeah. The stone shed. I think it. I know that we don't think something can happen in two years, but there's a lot of federal dollars right now for affordable housing, and I know that RW is trying to engage Downstreet to see if they could create a shovel-ready product project for that. So I would hate to see that property removed from the possibility of residential. Um, but for me, if if you were able to just do whatever that terminology is that would allow a single tenant to take my space in those uses, I would be in support of not removing myself or my property from the map. So 10 and 11 has been mentioned. What What is that? Um, food, food or beverage manufacturing enclosed and light industry enclosed, and they're both up to 4,000. And what, what I, is, have, I have both those uses in my building. Right. And both, I think, would want to take the whole space if they could at some point. Right. So, what what's your recommendation, Danny, on on that? Um, well, if we put, if we changed it to ten thousand, which is the number you know we've been been speaking of, you know, it's it is conditional. So it's um, it's something that, that you know isn't a given, but could but could be determined, um, you know, but by application, I assume. And so it feels like that's inclusive, then we could leave Foundry Street in, but it also gives, you know, a right of refusal if it doesn't seem like a, an appropriate use <clears throat> or the impact is too large. Would you do the same with specialty school? That's another, that's been limited to 4,000 square feet. Just do the same thing with that. It seems to make sense, but I haven't thought about it super critically. So if other people that's have that's opinions. That's a private school, so. Yeah. Not something that's real likely to happen in the downtown. Right. <laughs> closest thing we have is the uh, adult basic education facility, which is relatively small. Right, and again, it's still it's conditional, so it seems like a minimal a minimal enough risk that impact could be weighed before approval. Yeah. That speaking of that list there, the the school um, 
inspection there just mentioned um does that also include like a trade school type ability training school is that what you said trade so? trades trade like school. Yeah, any kind of private school um trying to find the definition sorry i'm um, I'll, I'll look construction trades i guess that's well, I, what was a... I think that's the idea right any specialty like that yeah. And what about building footprint? What what's your thought on that? Maximum building footprint. Would you follow the same logic? Because if you have a new building replacing the stone shed, and somebody wants to put in a ten thousand square foot building and put uh, food and beverage manufacturing in, let's just put, let's just paint a scenario. Then you know, then you're up you're up against the same thing. Um, you know, it seems to me. Well, Steve, isn't there a I mean, as far as um, as far as an existing building, if you tear it down, you have to build something that complies. But if it's destroyed by fire, you can put back what was there. That's correct, Bill. That's that's the way our current bylaws are set up. Correct. Okay. Steve and Ken, are there any other buildings in the downtown district? that are industrial zone that would be affected by, you know, if we changed our, our went to the interim zoning, whether we go to 10,000 or not. It's just those three properties. Just like those 30, three properties. 35, 30 and 40 sound to right. To me, it makes sense if, you know, not excluding yeah. keeping the zone consistent and just using as myself and Danny have went to that higher 10,000 uh, standard for, you know, you know, conditional uses 10 and 11. What would you do with building footprint, Mike? I'll put you on the spot. I would keep it at, at 10,000. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing and again it's still going to go if it's conditional use it's going to go to the drb and if something's really egregious they're going to put the appropriate conditions to make it work or as we've just said they can deny it you know not a difficult it's a difficult process but it can be done so this is a Maybe a funny question, but if you've got a building that's 10,000 square feet, you're occupying that building with a specific industry. And for whatever reason, you decide that that building is uh, inadequate as far as um, weatherization, functionality, whatever it may be, and you decide you want to tear it down and rebuild it at the same square footage but you still want to occupy it with that same business after the reconstruction from the rules that we're now proposing you'd have to fall under these new guidelines. Yep. I'm That's wondering right. if that, that should be somehow looked at. If somebody wants to tear down like bought a piece of property up in Holland there. I tore down the existing building with, that was there and I built the same footprint that was back, but I built a different building that was more energy efficient, yada, yada, yada. Um, so nothing changed for me and um, occupied it under the same scenario and you know, kind of residential and industrial, two different things, but the, the concept that I'm looking at is similar, so. Right, um, so if we increase the numbers, then it would be okay. But if we left the numbers, then yeah, it would not be okay to do that, even in the same space. My understanding of non-conforming structures is that when you have a non-conforming structure, which is what you're talking about, Chris, is that you you get the benefit of that footprint right. that typically most bylaws have a time limitation. Typically it's 12 months, and I think that's in our bylaw today. We, we had a discussion on this. So, you know, if you you know, you got a footprint on the ground, you tore down the existing structure and you rebuilt on that footprint. 
if that was greater than what would be ordinarily allowed, you would still get the benefit of the footprint. Unless there's some language in our bylaw that precludes that, that's sort of a, that's, that's a pretty standard kind of provision for dealing with non-conforming structures. Okay. <laughs> um, so it sounds like Mark wants to wants to keep the Foundry Street area in the district um, as long as uh, we can occupy that additional space. If we up the square footage to ten foot or ten thousand, um, without going through con conditional use. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, I don't know if that's easier, but that would satisfy my concerns, um, plus my concerns of the other building getting put back into industrial and not having residential opportunities in the next two years. And I don't think it's because of Mark or whatnot. I, I want to state this publicly because he could sell that building tomorrow and I'd be for that, you know, doing what was just said, regardless of, of if Mark owned it or not. I just think it's it's the right thing to do. It's it's a building that's existed there and it's something that we could do to make our community better. So whether Mark owns it, whether Mr. Or Mrs. XYZ own it, you know, I think it's, it's the right thing to do for our community. It's, it, again, let's let the DRB do their thing and make good decisions. Well, and I think it helps address Mark's issue of, you know, discouraging developers from coming in and uh, having to go through a, a more dragged out system process. Encourages developers from coming in and, and doing business in Waterbury, yeah. which I think is something I think very few people would be against. So, Steve, is there a way that you can change the wording to accommodate those concerns? Well, I would suggest making it a, in a motion to adopt with the following changes. I, I would adopt the, um, <clears throat> you know, move to adopt the interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district dated April 5th, and then make a list of the changes that you, you want to make. The, um, change the maximum building footprint to whatever you're going to decide, 10,000 square feet, um, change the um, upper limit for, um, we've discussed the food and beverage manufacturing, light industry and specialty school uh, to be uh, up to so many square feet, 10,000 square feet, whatever you decide only. And, um, we have one typo on the um, find it here. We've got a typo on the open open market or auction house that should be corrected. Uh, that should be up to four thousand for permitted, and greater than four thousand should be conditional. That was a typo in the draft. So I, I think you can make it as part of a motion to uh, adopt the draft as amended with the following changes. Does that make sense to you, Bill? No. To, to get this going, at least to put it on the table, let, let me take a stab at it. I, I move to uh, approve the interim bylaws for the downtown uh, zoning district draft of April 5th, 2021 with the following revisions. Section 1604.3 conditional uses be amended in number 10 to reference 10,000 square feet, number 11 reference 10,000 square feet, and in section 1604.4 dimensional standards change the uh, maximum uh, maximum principal building footprint to 10,000 square feet. Is 
I mean, if you could just correct the typo for the uh, and and also to to, uh, to correct yeah. the typo thousand reference all in four thousand square feet to reference four thousand uh, greater than four thousand square feet. Yeah, for conditional four thousand plus or minus. Yeah, greater than four thousand. Greater than four thousand. That was open market or auction house, right? You faded out just a little bit, Mike. Yep. Okay. You might want to check with Patty, make sure she. Was there anything else, Mike? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Nope. I, 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 that's it. It's kind of short and sweet. Uh, if someone wants to second it, and then we could have a discussion. And if, and if someone wants to amend that, I'd be amicable to uh, good amendments. Or ask for a second, Tara. I just wanted to make sure that we had everything in there that, that you were uh, thinking. So it sounds like you do. So I will ask for a second. Go ahead, Katie. Go ahead. <laughs> Katie seconds it. Is there any further discussion, please? I have a quick question. Um, uh, so something that was brought up was the concern about the um, restaurant definition where it was like 40% um, of the space to be dining and I'm not looking at the section, I'm really sorry. Um, and I was just curious if any other select board members had concerns about that. It had been raised, you know, certain like Chinese food restaurants or takeout pizza restaurants and that might limit their the definition of use. And I didn't know if we were concerned about that or if that felt resolved. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, good point. Oh, you want me to speak to that, Mike? I'm sorry. No, I thought Danny had a good point there. Yeah, so this was a comment that came up. Um, yeah, I think the suggestion was to take out the sentence um, that says a restaurant that has both eat-in and takeout service will be classified as a sit-down restaurant, provided that the dining area, exclusive of any outdoor dining, comprises at least 40% of the total floor area of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I would suggest in the first sentence um, is um, to, to take that second sentence out and then in the first sentence say an establishment that prepares and serves meals, snacks, and beverages primarily for uh, immediate consumption um, with seating on premises um, and uh, possible takeout service or something like that. I don't know if that would address that. I think a restaurant typically is defined where you have um, for uh, preparation and consumption of meals, beverages for consumption uh, on uh, premises or with seating on premises. And you can mention takeout. I don't think you even have to mention takeout service, but I think that would address that issue. I don't know what you think of that, Danny. So to my point, do we now need to amend the uh, motion to include that change? I, I think we do, and I'm very amicable to that amendment. Yeah, you get a, another crack at it, Mike. Uh, I got a, what section is that in the- um... So this is section, um, <laughs> oh, the one- it's The it's use it. and definition. Yeah, 1606 <laughs> use table, definition of restaurant slash bar. I would- I'm uh, scrolling. Okay. Steve, just a quick question. If you end up under these uh, limitations, you just end up as a retailer? Um, correct, so if you're just, strictly take out so it doesn't really like it doesn't affect you i guess you'd fall under whether or not you have to go under certain conditional uses because re does retail have doesn't it have the same conditional size constraints uh yes it does so maybe you don't really have to change this because you would just end up as a takeout place you end up under retail but you still have if you're over a certain size you still have to go to conditional use and talk about it right. i don't know i'm just talking out loud but 
Danny, do you think if we just omitted that one sentence, that would, um, the 40%? Yeah, and I, I mean, Mark brings up a good point. I don't know what the, I don't know um, what consequences there may or may not be for a restaurant if if they fall under retail. So um, I'm not sure who might be able to speak really precisely to that. If there's literally no other consequences and it doesn't matter, you know, then maybe we don't need to worry too much about the change. But it just seems like. Um, yeah, if we just took out that 40% definition. I lost my what I would What I would suggest is, um, if you take the second sentence, I would modify the first sentence to say, um, an establishment that prepares and serves meals, snacks, and beverages, primarily for immediate consumption um, with seating on premises, something of that nature. Ken, do you see a problem with that by taking that 40% out? Um, I don't necessarily have any concerns about it. So then we can just remove that second sentence like uh, Steve recommended. Yeah, and I would modify the first sentence. So you're if you saying, have a deli, you know, a deli at, um, you know, at uh, any of the convenience stores, gas station convenience stores, you know, that's not a restaurant, it's a deli, and the, the food is taken off premises. So it's typically for consumption. On premises. And on, premise, uh, on premises. On premises for seating, yeah. Well. We're in the we're in this thing that everyone's going to take out, even restaurants right now. Yeah, but they're they're they they do rely on their seating, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they want tents for seating. They want as much seating as they can get. <laughs> I understand that. Mm -hmm. Just we're in a crazy world. So do you want to add that to your list and your motion? yeah? I I eliminate the second sentence and just put for immediate consumption and what was the phrase on site um, um uh, yeah on -premises. consumption on premises oh. yeah immediate consumption on, on site on premises with uh, on premises that would see yep. i'm good with that favorable amendment All right. We so probably need a second to that amendment. I was just going to say a motion's been made and we need another second. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Any of the planning commission have anything they'd like to make a comment on before we pull the vote? I'm good. Seeing none. All those in favor of uh, the motion made, please say aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, Mark, did you recuse yourself then? I know you said you were recusing yourself. Sounds like you did. Yeah, I, I can't vote on that. Thanks. That's, that's fine. Just wanted to clarify for the purpose of the minute. That's all. Thanks. Well, thanks again, Ken, for all your work. Um, we appreciate it more than I think you know. Um, it's an integral part of the the community, and uh, you know I I think it's not an easy task, and uh, your efforts are commended. Yes, thank you, Ken. You know the next the next part is going to be even harder to develop overall zoning bylaws. You know for the whole community, that's going to be our even greater challenge. Melissa, you had something? Well, I should um, let Ken speak first if he wants to, and then I can go. Uh, I don't necessarily have anything to say other than thank you. And, you know, uh, 
the planning commission uh, hopefully will be up to the task that's presented to them and uh, wrestling with the permanent bylaws going forward. We know you I, guys will be. Yeah, I will not be part of that. Um, so, so, you know, but the other members of the planning commission, uh, you know, they will take up the, they will take up the task. You, you'll be phasing out then I take it. Uh, after uh, midnight Friday night, my term will be over. And uh, so, so that'll be, that'll be the end of my formal participation on, on these things. So. Thank you for all your, your years of service. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, Ken. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ken. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, Steve. All I was going to say, Ken's been a great collaborator and leader. I worked with him professionally at RW, and I think he's been a real asset to the community. I know he served in the role long before I was part of this community. So just wanted to thank and acknowledge him to the select board, um, as I did with the Planning Commission last week. So thanks, Ken. We'll miss you. Welcome. Thank you. Well, hopefully the adoption of these interims will uh, be close enough to the actual uh, a permanent draft, permanent set of rules that uh, there won't be too many changes and hopefully we got it right. Um, that's an awful big hopeful, but because <laughs> it's always, zoning regs are a huge moving target uh, and I don't think they'll ever change from being that, but. Uh, Chris, so that's, why, that's why they're interim bylaws because if there is some changes and tweaks needed when the full bylaws come out that's when we're able to do it if if we we made a little mistake you know we'll learn from our mistake and correct it well it's one thing us humans have uh recognized that if we don't something like something in life uh all we have to do is change the rules and do something different um <laughs> kind of an oxymoron sometimes but so any other business to conduct tonight other than what we've done? Anybody else got any more comments or questions? If not, I think we can uh, have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, I just want to add for next week, I will be tapping out early around 830 because I have a prior engagement. So just so you're all aware. Thanks for the heads up, Katie. You all have a good night and um, thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate all your time. I think it got us over a, a, a little hurdle amongst many more to come. Thank you. Everyone. I'm Thank actually you. surprised we finished early. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Take care. Bye. Bye. Steve, did I miss a motion to approve the agenda that I should? Yes. Um, hold on, Patty. Um, so Danny moved and Katie seconded the motion to approve the agenda. And at that point, it was passed four to zero. Some. Um, I know we had one member who arrived late. That sound right, Mike? Yep. Okay, I think you came in after that. Yeah, I didn't. Re I'm so used to seven o'clock yeah. starts. <laughs> and, I knew that would be a toughie at six fifty. So that's yeah, it, it's it's just like, and then I I saw I looked at my agenda and I said, whoops. Yeah, uh, that's all right. You came in. Thank you for all. Okay, your... I got it. Okay, great. Thanks, Patty. And I'll I'll go through whatever you come up with. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. You always keep a good set of notes. Yeah. Steve does a good job editing. <laughs> yeah, we make a good team, Mike. All right. Thanks again, Mike. Yep. Appreciate it. All right. See you. Thank you guys. Thank you all for your work. Okay, you're welcome. Take care.